black hole gains no mass as it forms. So the gravitational field at and beyond the star's original radius is no greater than before the star's collapse. An orbiting planet would keep on orbiting as though nothing happened. So please don't think of a black hole as some entity that eats up every object surrounding it. The biggest danger is if you find yourself within the original radius of the star. That's where things would get, well, interesting. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the geometry immediately surrounding a black hole. Light passing by a black hole is easily deflected. If it comes in at a certain angle, the light can actually enter into an orbit around the black hole. We call this the photon sphere. A spaceship with powerful enough engines could enter within the photon sphere, do some fun experiments, and then come back out. The deeper the spaceship descends below the photon sphere, however, the more difficult it becomes to escape. Not only for the astronauts, but for any light beam they may try to send away from the black hole. The farther down they go, the more straight up they would need to point the light for the light to escape. Eventually, even the vertically oriented light beam does not make it out. When this happens, they have entered what we call the event horizon. The event horizon is often thought of as the surface of a black hole, but it's not really a surface. Rather, it's the mathematical boundary of no return. It wouldn't matter how powerful your engines, once you pass through the event horizon, there's no way for you to return. You have essentially left our universe as we know it. The greater the mass of a black hole, the larger the event horizon. If Betelgeuse were to collapse into a black hole, its event horizon would have a radius of about 30 kilometers. It would be impossible to survive the passage through this event horizon because you'd be ripped apart by tidal forces. In other words, the gravitational pull on your feet would be vastly greater than the gravitational pull on your head. The result is your legs get yanked away, or your spaceship gets ripped apart. A white dwarf is about the size of Earth. A neutron star is about the size of a small city. Beneath the event horizon, how large is that remnant of the collapsed star? Oh, quite small. It may shrink to become smaller than an electron. Actually, much smaller than that. And all the way down to an infinitely dense point, which we call a singularity. But there's an interesting issue I have yet to bring up with you. And it deserves some attention. Mass is affected by gravity. It falls. Got that? Check. Um, light is also affected by gravity. Uh, that's a bit of a stretch, but I got that too. Check. Here's a new one for you. Time itself is affected by gravity. The stronger the gravitational field, the slower the passing of time. This is to say that a clock at the bottom of a skyscraper runs a bit slower than an identical clock at the top of the skyscraper. Why? Because the gravitational field is a bit stronger at the bottom of the building than it is at the top. But Earth's gravity is so relatively weak that this difference in time is barely measurable. Though, interestingly, it has in fact been measured. On a practical level, a satellites up in space experience a weaker gravitational field simply because they're farther away from Earth's center of gravity. Time itself, therefore, moves forward a bit faster on the satellites than it does down here on Earth's surface. This effect needs to be accounted for, otherwise our GPS systems wouldn't be as accurate as they are. For a skyscraper on a white dwarf, the difference for how fast clocks run within different floors would be blatantly obvious. On a neutron star? <laughs> Absolutely. Imagine two identical twins, each with a body able to withstand the staggering gravitational forces on a neutron star. 
The twin living downstairs may get to the age of 25 when he decides to visit his brother. He walks up the stairs to discover his brother's great-great-great-grandchildren. After a long, healthy life, his brother had died centuries earlier. How fast time flows is always the same for yourself, and that would be 60 seconds per minute. But that doesn't mean it flows at the same rate relative to someone else. We'll talk more about this when we get into future lessons on Einstein's theories of relativity. For now, what I want you to recognize is that you can't fall into a black hole without there being some weird distortion of time. Let's do a thought experiment. Say you're in a spaceship orbiting a black hole. You then decide to drop a clock into the black hole with an infinitely strong tether. As you watch it descend, you'll see that its timing slows down relative to your ship's clock. Interestingly, the light coming from the lowered clock also shifts from yellow to red, while your ship's identical clock remains yellow. Why? Because light from the lower clock is losing energy as it's trying to climb up toward your ship out of the strong gravitational field. Although it leaves the clock as higher energy yellow, it arrives to your ship as lower energy red. Hmm. Eventually the clock stops ticking altogether. And from your point of view on the spaceship, you'll see that it takes an infinite amount of time for that clock to actually reach the event horizon. Which is to say, the light from the event horizon never reaches you. You grow impatient, and so you decide to put on a spacesuit and jump downward yourself. Maybe you expect to see your watch slow down. Nope, that's not what happens. Your clock and you, wherever you are, will always experience 60 seconds in a minute. Changes in time only ever happen relative to the other guy. That's why we call it relativity. Look upward at the clock on your receding spaceship, and you'll see that it's moving faster, while also turning a higher energy blue. You've experienced maybe only a minute, Yet the clock on your spaceship shows a year has already passed for your colleagues. After another minute, it's been a decade, and your shipmates, they're restless. Uh, the cord snaps, and they're gone. In freefall, looking up, you see an ever-narrowing view of the universe you once called home. In a blip, you witness its entire lifespan, and then poof, it's gone. You've just fallen through the event horizon which, remember, is a mathematical boundary, not an actual surface. Your continued journey downward has a 100% probability. So when we're talking about a supermassive star collapsing to an infinitely small point of space, there's something you gotta appreciate. The formation of that singularity won't actually happen until our universe itself has long expired. So how large is a megastar after it collapses to become a black hole? A pretty darn small by comparison, but not infinitely small. At least, not yet. You might be thinking that watching something fall into a black hole is pure science fiction. Think again. Astronomers have their telescopes skillfully aimed at the center of our galaxy, where lies Sagittarius A star, which is that supermassive black hole having a mass of about four million times that of our sun. They're tracking a cloud of gas that will be skimming right by it over the next several decades. It's a prime opportunity to learn much more about this perfectly natural phenomenon. After thinking about black holes, you'll no doubt have lots of questions. Write those questions down so you can discuss them with others, such as your classmate and course instructor. Also bear in mind that much of what we talked about here will be explored more deeply in our subsequent discussions on Einstein's theories of relativity. Look forward to that. Well, now you've been introduced to planets, nebula, stars, supernova, and, and now black holes. All of these, of course, combine to make a much larger entity we call a galaxy. And amazingly, galaxies grace our universe like snowflakes in a snowstorm. 
So let's explore galaxies in the next lesson. Good science to you.